Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. We're starting a new chapter today, chapter five, on discrete probability distributions. Uh, we will actually just cover the first three sections of this chapter. We won't talk about the hypergeometric distribution. So let's start with section 5.1, which is introduction to discrete probability distributions. So I think we talked about this back in chapter one, the difference between uh, discrete data and continuous data. Remember that discrete data, uh, the values are whole numbers, uh, usually answers the question how many as opposed to how much. So these are things that can be counted like number of complaints per day, number of TVs in a household, or the number of rings before the phone is answered. Continuous data, which we'll talk about uh, starting in the ne next chapter, can potentially take on any value depending only on the ability to measure accurately. Uh, so continuous data often answers the question, how much? Uh, and these are often measured, so fractional or decimal values are possible, such as the thickness of an item, the time required to complete a task, the temperature of a solution, or the height in inches, because that could be a decimal, right? So here you see the difference in, uh, if you were to graph the uh, probability distributions, what you see on the left here is actually a histogram. Uh, so the probability distribution for a discrete variable uh, can be graphed using a histogram. A continuous uh, probability distribution has to be graphed with a curve. So we'll talk about that starting in the next chapter. Discrete random variables have outcomes that typically take on whole numbers as a result of conducting an experiment, whereas counting, uh, sorry, continuous random variables have outcomes that take on any numerical value as a result of conducting an experiment. Now, I take a little bit of issue with this chart at the bottom. I totally agree with what it says on the right side. How many data values can be found in a, oh, in a specific interval? Never mind, I'm good. Uh, so within a specific bounded interval, <clears throat> uh, a discrete random variable, you will only find a finite number of values, whereas uh, in a specific interval for a continuous random variable, you would find an infinite number of outcomes, such as all real numbers between, say, one and five. All right, there's an infinite number of those, but between one and five, there are only a finite number of uh, whole numbers, right? Two, three, and four, and possibly one and five, <clears throat> depending on whether those are included. Okay, so for this chapter, we will only talk about discrete probability distributions. So when we talk about a discrete probability distribution, we're talking about a listing of all the possible outcomes of an experiment for a discrete random variable, along with the relative frequency of each outcome. So in the last chapter, we were talking about probability. So when we talk about a random variable, what we're talking about is a set of numerical values, the possible values that you can get in your experiment, along with the probability <clears throat> of each of those outcomes. So here's a uh, nice simple example. The experiment is you're going to toss two coins. The random variable X is the number of heads obtained in two tosses of the coin. So the possible values for X are zero, one, and two. And you can see over on the left there, they've shown you all the different possible ways of um, that this could turn out, that this experiment could turn out. You could get two tails. You could get tails on the first coin, heads on the second coin, or you could get heads on the first coin, tails on the second. And finally, you could get two heads. So the probability of getting zero heads is just the probability of the outcome TT. So that uh, probability is one fourth or 0.25. Now there are two outcomes that give you one head, right? TH and also HT. So since those account for two outcomes out of the four, that probability is two fourths, which is 0.5. 
And then finally, the probability of the outcome HH, which is the only way of getting two heads, <clears throat> is one fourth or 0.25. So nice, simple, discrete random variable. And here is the probability histogram uh, for that random variable. So a discrete random uh, probability distribution meets the following conditions. First, uh, each outcome in the distribution needs to be mutually exclusive with other outcomes in the distribution. So what I mean by that is uh, there is no overlap between x equals 0 and x equals 1. There is no outcome uh, that would give you both of those values. So uh, notice that these four uh, coin tosses are sorted into three boxes. And those three boxes are mutually exclusive uh, from each other. So that's kind of what they mean there. Second, the probability of each outcome, P of X, must be between zero and one inclusive. Uh, and I think we talked about that in the last chapter, right? A probability value always has to be between zero and one. And finally, we also talked about this in the last chapter, the sum of the probabilities for all the outcomes in the distribution must be one. So you see that happened with this experiment right here. If you added these three probabilities together, they add up to one. The mean called mu of a discrete probability distribution is the weighted average of the outcomes of the random variables that comprise it. The mean of a uh, random variable is also known as its expected value, and that is written E of X. The formula to find expected value or mean uh, looks like this. So uh, it'll make a lot more sense, of course, when we do an example. You take each value of the random variable, multiply it by its corresponding probability, and then add all those products together. Okay, and down here it explains all that notation. All right, so for the experiment we were just looking at, uh, remember the possible values of the random variable were 0, 1, and 2, uh, and those outcomes occur with probabilities 0 0.25, 0 0.5, and 0.25. So the way that we get this column over here is we just go 0 times 0.25 equals 0. 1 times 0.5 equals 0.5. 2 times 0.25 equals 0.5. When you add those values together, you get the mean or expected value of this random variable. The mean of this random variable is 1. And what that means is if you were to do this experiment many, many, many times, the average number of heads in two tosses of the coin is one, which kind of makes sense, right? Okay, I think I'm gonna skip over this. I have never once used this uh, function. Uh, you're welcome to use it to check your answers if you'd like, but I'm not gonna talk about it. Okay, so um, <clears throat> along with a mean, a random variable also has a variance. And just like before, the variance is a measure of the spread of the individual values around the mean of a data set. Now, this is one of two different formulas that I'm going to show you for the variance. Uh, remember in, was it chapter three, I think, uh, that I showed you two different ways to find the variance uh, normally, so uh, this is kind of like that. And uh, you might find the second formula a little easier to use. Uh, it does not require you to calculate the mean ahead of time, just like with the other two formulas. So the way this works, first you have to calculate the mean, then you subtract the mean from every outcome of the random variable, you square all those values, and then multiply those squares by the corresponding probabilities and finally add those all together. And that gives you the variance. 
so here is the equivalent shortcut formula. I'm sorry, I, <clears throat> I told a little lie. I forgot. You do have to find the mean first to use this uh, formula, but you still might find it a little easier. So the way this one works is you square each value of the random variable, multiply those squares by the corresponding probabilities, add those together, and then at the end, you subtract the mean squared, okay? So as they say, it's, uh, this formula is easier to use when you're calculating the variance by hand, which is normally what we will be doing. And just like in chapter three, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So if I ask you to find the variance and the standard deviation, you're gonna spend about 95% of the time in that problem finding the variance. And then it just takes you a few seconds to find the standard deviation. So I'm gonna show you uh, uh, both formulas and I, I checked ahead of time because you know, sometimes I don't, I'm not so crazy about the way they explain these, but I do like how they set up this table. This is exactly the way I would do it. So over here, you have your uh, values of the random variable. You have the probabilities. Uh, they put in a column with the mean. Remember earlier, we found that the mean was one. So the first thing they're doing is they're taking each value and subtracting the mean. So watch my pointer here. Let me see, can I put a, can I turn this into a spotlight? Yes, let's do that. Okay, so zero minus one is negative one. One minus one is zero. Two minus one is one. So there's our X minus mu column. Now I'm going to take these values and square them. So just like I told you back in chapter three, you should not have any negative values in this column. The square of negative one <clears throat> is one. The square of zero is zero and the square of one is one. And then the last thing I'm going to do, watch my spotlight, is I'm going to take these values and multiply them by the probabilities way over here. So ready? One times 0.25 is 0.25. Zero times 0.5 is zero. One times 0.25 is 0.25. So when you add these values together, that will give you the variance. The variance of this random variable is 0.5 heads squared. Don't ask me what that means because I don't know. All right. Uh, remember in chapter three, uh, and I think this is the main reason we use the standard deviation instead of the variance most of the time is that the standard deviation is measured in the same units as the original data. In this case, the original random variable so when you take the square root of 0.5, you get 0 0.707, and that is a uh, number of heads. So the standard deviation for this random variable is 0 0.707 heads. Okay. All right. So here it is using the shortcut method. Let me put my spotlight back on. So here's the number of heads, 0, 1, or 2. The first thing we're going to do is square those. So we get 0, 1, and 4. Multiply those squares by the corresponding probabilities. 0 times 0 0.25 is 0. 1 times 0 0.5 is 0.5. 4 times 0 0.25 is 1. These values add up to 1.5. So now sigma squared is that sum that we just found which is 1.5 minus the square of the mean. <clears throat> so earlier we found that the mean was one. 1.5 minus one squared is 0.5. So it gives you the same answer. It should always give you the same answer. So, I mean, this might be a way to check your work. You know, if it's not a huge random variable, just calculate it using both formulas. And I'd say if you get the same answer both times, 
uh, I would bet that you're probably correct. And of course, the square root of 0.5 is still 0 0.707. All right. The mean and standard deviation are useful when comparing two different distributions. So in this example, we're asking, is there a statistical difference in the reviewer ratings between the books Statistics for Dummies and the Cartoon Guide to Statistics. I've never heard of that second one. That sounds kind of fun. So the table below provides the data. <clears throat> so uh, reviewers can give these books anywhere between one and five stars. Uh, there were 67 people that reviewed Statistics for Dummies and you can see their uh, ratings here. 42 people gave it five stars, 11 people gave it four stars, seven people gave it three stars, et cetera, et cetera, which means using the relative frequency method, these are the probabilities of picking a reviewer that gave that particular review. Uh, notice these add up to one like they always should. And then the same kind of thing for the cartoon guide to statistics that had a lot more reviewers, 201. Uh, so you find those relative frequencies and they add up to one. Now, what I would like you to do, uh, because they actually didn't show their work here, I would like you to try to calculate the mean, the variance, and the standard deviation, ideally for both of these, for uh, the rating for statistics for dummies and also for the cartoon guide to statistics. Uh, we're going to show those on the next slide. So uh, please pause the video and try that. Do at least one of them. All right, so you get the practice. <clears throat> All right, so let's now uh, see how you did. The mean rating for statistics for dummies came out to 4.253. The variance is 1.387 and the standard deviation is 1.178. So the units for the mean and the standard deviation is stars, all right? How many stars uh, the review is. And for the cartoon guide, the mean rating was 4.133. The variance is 1.433 and the standard deviation is 1.197. So the average rating for statistics for dummies is slightly higher, uh, only by 0.12. So that's very close. Um, the standard deviations, though, are very, very close. I, I wouldn't even bother pointing out that this one is higher. All right, those are so close together. OK, so it's kind of hard to tell at this point whether the mean rating for statistics for dummies is significantly higher. Um, it is a little higher, uh, but overall I would say they are pretty similar. All right, and finally we'll talk about expected monetary value. Uh, the expected monetary value is just the mean of a discrete probability distribution when the discrete random variable is expressed in terms of dollars. Uh, and so this EMV represents a long-term average as if outcomes from the distribution occurred many, many times. So here's an example. <clears throat> Calculation of EMV from crop yield. So if the weather is dry, the profit is $200,000, and that occurs with probability 0.3. If the weather is light rain, the profit is $300,000, and that occurs with probability 0.5. If there's a storm, the probability of uh, the profit is $150,000, that occurs with probability 0.2. So if we find the mean or expected value, and now we're also calling it the EMV, expected monetary value, for that random variable. Uh, they didn't do it in the form of a table this time. They just uh, went ahead. I mean, you can see how this would work, right? You just add another column over here, and you go this times this equals this, this times this equals this, this times this 
equals this. And then you would add those all together. Uh, so here it is, 200,000 times 0 0.3 plus 300,000 times 0 0.5 plus 150,000 times 0 0.2 gives you an expected monetary value of $240,000 which means the long-term average over say many, many seasons um, would be $240,000 in profit. Oop, and that's gonna do it for section 5.1. So we will ah, we'll look at this sec next section next time. Take care. <laughs>